This episode, I'm joined by Maurizio Loza, who is a writer, designer, and independent researcher working in the intersection of technology, religion, and biopolitics. In this episode, we discuss his book, The Hounds of Action, The Magical Origins of Public Relations and Modern Media, alongside discussions on the will, occultism, and Renaissance magic. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Hermetic's podcast or become part of the community, both of these things keep it, keep us going. Please find links in the description below. Enjoy. So, Maurizio Loza, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetic's podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so, you know, I briefly, you know, we were chatting before and I briefly said I was doing some research on Ficino, Marsilio Ficino, and up pops... The, this book, uh, which hasn't been out very long, it was only published last year by Maurizio Loza, and it's a book with with a title where my mind instantly thought, right, I I have to interview this guy. And the title and the book we'll be talking about today is The Hounds of Action: The Magical Origins of Public Relations and Modern Media. Now, it's for those who are wondering, sort of, what's it about? It's in the vein of the work of Fionn Culliano with the Eros and Magic in the Renaissance. It's sort of um, along the lines of those who've listened to the podcast before about what John Michael Greer writes about in terms of the modern society having this underlying magical or occult influence on us. Um, but this is a book which really digs into the the, sp- the the nitty-gritty and the specifics of the history related to that, touching on uh, a wide array of the figures which actually have probably come up on this podcast before. So Giordano Bruno, uh, Guy Debord, uh, Wilhelm Reich, and a lot of these sort of forgotten figures. And there's probably a thread there that we could we could touch on as to why, you know, all these figures are in a way forgotten as well, and or at least cast aside. Um, mm-hmm. But before we begin with the book, uh, Maurizio, just tell us a little bit about you and, and, and how the book came about and what it is you, you do. Okay. Um, okay, I'm a Colombian writer, designer, and independent researcher. I studied graphic design and I've worked as a as a marketing and design consultant for some 18 years now. And in this time, I became interested in, in the ways that media and technology impact society. A couple of years ago, I published a book called Contra el Transhumanismo, that means Against Transhumanism, which is a critique of transhumanist philosophies, in particular of the work of Raymond Kurzweil. And I've also done some unpublished work on the evolution of consciousness, taking Jean Gebster and and Owen Barfield as a starting point. So I think you can say that I've always had an interest in how human thought and perception have evolved over time. And um, well, since I was a trained uh, since I was trained as a designer uh, in my work, I eventually came to realize that there was this this kind of hidden uh, component to advertising that I, that I couldn't quite put my finger on, but it would be characterized as a sort of mm, magic spell. So I, I entertained this idea in my head for years without um, having much information to go on. And... Uh, uh, well, until I found the work of Johan Kuliano some five or six years ago. And, um, well, in that book, in, in Arrows and Magic and the Renaissance, which uh, you have uh, already mentioned, I found uh, a conceptual and historical framework to develop my thesis. That's kind of how the book came into being. Okay, okay. Just out of interest, I mean, you you mentioned your critique of uh, Ray Kurzweil. Uh, mm-hmm. have, you, have you happened to read John Michael Guerron cuts far? No, I haven't. Okay, I haven't his, his sort of uh, thesis is that Kurzweil is just another reiteration of uh, the Christian mm-hmm. fall, you know, original sin, and then our mm-hmm. sort of rapture in heaven will be transhumanist. So he just sees that as a complete repeat of a religious uh, yeah. fr- religious framework. <laughs> well, in a no, in a sense it is. I, I mean, uh, actually, in that book, and 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 against transhumanism. I, I uh, well, I, I touched on this. Uh, it's not the principal argument, but I say that it's a, it's a Gnostic retelling or a Gnostic re-elaboration. Uh, it's kind of that cosmology turned into uh, technology things. Yeah, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think I would agree with this, uh, with Greer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I mean, um, 
perhaps before we jump in, I mean, do you do you mind if I ask? Do you have any magical background personally? Do you practice anything or? Well, not really. I I can do a couple of things, but I'm not a. I wouldn't say I'm a practical. You know, like a magician. I have an interest, but I'm really respectful of the thing. So I I tend to you know stay away from it. I right. can do a couple of things, but I don't tend to abuse it. Yeah. <laughs> okay.、Know? Okay. And yeah, yeah. I understand. Um. Okay. Okay. So I do have to ask you the hermetics question before we、mm-hmm. sort of go any further. Um. You can、right. place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Uh. Who do you、yeah. pick? Okay. Um. Well, I was thinking about this question. I was reminded of a book by Stefan Zweig called Mental Healers. I don't know if you've if you've read it. It's a very good book, and it consists of、uh, three biographies. One for Franz Anton Mesmer, who is、uh, the father of animal magnetism.、Uh, another for Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, and、uh, the third is for Sigmund Freud, who doesn't need much of an introduction.、Uh, so now, to answer your question, what I would do is I would replace Baker Eddy for Wilhelm Reich,、mm. who is one of Freud's most interesting. Controversial and also underappreciated disciples. So it would be Mesmer, Freud, and, and Reich. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Where where would you like that conversation to sort of head? Where do you, where do you think that it might naturally lead? Oh、uh, well, the way I see it, I mean, what I was thinking、uh, when I imagined those three characters、uh, in the same room was to put my thesis to the test. You know, to to find out if they are. Able to admit to realize that they have a lot in common and they actually belong to the same lineage. That's what I would like to find out. Yeah. So those those were the three thinkers that you primarily touched on in your in your thesis. Um. Well, not the primarily, but you know there is a line that that connects them pretty clearly. Uh. Well, it's it's a direct transmission between Freud and Reich. Obviously, it's not so obvious between Mesmer and the other two, but still. I think they share,、uh, well, they share some concepts. Eros, Eros appears in all three of them, in in、uh, Freud and in Reich as libido, and you know the notion of pneuma or of,、uh, of spirit, you know, let's call it a vital force. It appears in in Mesmer, and it also appears in in Reich as orgon, and it's not so evident in Freud, but it's kind of there if you if you dig a little bit. More into his work, you know, pre、uh, psychoanalysis when he was、uh, a student of、uh, of Charcot in Paris, you know, during his、uh, hypnosis phase, you can you can sense that there was a there was a kind of、um, you know connection to this mystical thing. Well, he he did、uh, admit that there was this component、uh, in hypnosis that he couldn't quite explain, and he said, "Yeah, it must be mystical." But being a rationalist, he, he He didn't go any further. Yeah, he eventually sort of、uh, doubled down on that that rationalism. I don't know, you know,、yeah. obviously the the relationship between him and Jung is well documented. I don't know、mm-hmm. what what was his relationship like with Reich. Was he supportive, or was it sort of the same thing as、um, with Jung? Well, what happened is, you know, it's kind of the same evolution in the relationship.、Uh, they were very close for a time, but they began to drift away. When Reich became more of a radical, politically speaking, and well, I think Reich was a very peculiar thinker in that he he didn't. I mean, he never went half of the way. He always had to go all the way with the concept. So、uh, he just pushed many of Freud's concept concepts to to the limits, and this is how you get his transition from、uh, psychology. To the social, to the natural sciences, for example, and so they began to drift away because they didn't have, you know, they didn't get any more common ground between themselves. I think this happened like in the early thirties,、uh, and it was really, it was really hard for Wright because he was expelled from the psychoanalytical、uh, society in Vienna, and then he had to flee、um, Germany,、um, you know, fleeing from the Nazis. So it was kind of a hard life. Yeah, but they didn't end up. Good, those two. So it would be kind of a rowdy conversation, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, so really, the the I mean, it's sort of a synchronicity, a coincidence in the way. I just、mm-hmm. the last episode I recorded is 
you know, yet to go out. It's actually on uh, Franz Anton Mesmer and this, this oh. in relation to uh, Gurdjieff and this notion of a vital force and and the controlling of that. And you know, I think this is probably going to play a big part. So I think that the the eros and the the underlying vital force, which is prevalent in all those thinkers that you mentioned, will come up back in later. But diving in into your book. And I'm sure, you know, as I say, I'm sure we'll dip back into these thinkers. Mm-hmm. I sort of thought perhaps we should begin with Corleano's sort of underlying thesis that mm-hmm. that modern control mechanisms advertising the artificial creation of desire. These I've put down as synonymous with Renaissance, Rena, uh, Renaissance magic, which I'm now realizing is sort of wrong because really they they are that right. They are the exact mm-hmm. same apparatus. So what? You know, you sort of go off from this this thesis which Cugliano puts forth in Eros and Magic in the Renaissance. So I was wondering if you could sort of expand on this, because this is the foundational idea that's sort of underlying your text, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. So um, I think we can say that Renaissance Magic originates advertisement, PR, and, and uh, many other modern control mechanisms because of its erotic component which was defined by Giordano Bruno in, um, in a 16th century book called De Vinculis in Generi, which means uh, on bonds in general. So this book in itself, I think it's remarkable because apart from being a, about magic, it presents what we could call a proto-psychology as it addresses you know, the inner motivations and desires of individuals and masses and, and explains how to manipulate them. So um, in broad strokes, uh, this work by Bruno proposes that Eros is the main way through which uh, someone can generate bonds or, you know, that is certain ways to psychologically uh, tie an individual or a mass to manipulate it. And it is precisely this kind of manipulation of desire uh, that advertising and PR inherited from Renaissance magic. So I think the moment when Renaissance erotic magic became really relevant to um, to modern control techniques is when we went from being an economy of necessity to an economy of desire in the late 19th century. I think that was the moment when uh, the stage was set for this erotic magical operations to spring to their full potential in 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 capitalism Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so do you think there's an intrinsic link with so there you believe there is an intrinsic link with capitalism and this form of magic then Mm, well i wouldn't say intrinsic it could be taken as that i mean as far as desire is concerned yes but i think it it is sort of a for teachers uh coincidence that we came up with a type of economic system that makes, you know, that it stresses so much on desire. So when this happens and, and, and you know, these two things, these two ideas converge, you get uh, this new, uh, this new techniques to manipulate desire, to manage desire at many levels, which is, I think, what, ha- what happened with, with advertising, with marketing, with PR, you know, all those disciplines that uh, were born in the 20th century, they they do a state, they, uh, they unite these two strands, if not these two ways of thinking, economically and magically speaking. So I guess the big, the big question would be, why, why, does, why does PR, why, why, do, why does advertising wish to control people, you know, in this way? Why does it wish to artificially create desire? Is it as simple as you know, the acquisition of status and money, or is there a deeper, more occult meaning to it? No, I don't think there is an occult meaning. I think it's, I think everything is pretty secular by now. Well, in the case of advertising, of course, it's about selling, you know, their peddling stuff. But um, in in politics, it takes a darker uh, tinge, this. I think it's more about control. That's why we we talked about uh, control mechanisms. So, uh, well, to, to, uh, to use Noam Chomsky's term, it's more about manufacturing consent. So that's, that's one of the applications. But I don't think there are more occult uh, purposes behind it, if you know what I mean. I think it's pretty, 
pretty secular than ours. Okay, so really it's actually sort of a, the, the whole boring dystopia idea, except it's sort of a magic has been magic has been stripped of anything of quality and has been reduced to, to that function, functional mm. ability to control people. Yes, I think so. I, I do think so. It's a it's a disenchanted form of magic, pretty much. Well, okay. I could be wrong, but yeah, I, I do think so. So what do you think that the 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 enchanted bit was, which has been stripped off? You know, mm -hmm. what, what form did that take originally? Well, originally magic, well, magic was born of an enchanted world uh, when, when magic was, um, you know, the main way of, of uh, interacting with the world. And I'm thinking about millennia, not, not just uh, 500 years ago. Uh, we lived, we, we inhabited a very different world in which uh, we were not, you know, uh, we didn't have a distance between ourselves and objects. That, that kind of thing didn't, didn't happen. Uh, we felt that everything was kind of linked, everything was united, so we could operate on, uh, you know, something at a distance through a fetish, for example. So it, it, it comes from a very different view of things, I think. And this has been stripped of its of its original meaning, as you as you mentioned now, and we are at the end phase of that of that you know uh, denuding of meaning of magic. We just made it into into a technical device. So what do you what do you think comes next? Well, next I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think we could you know. Uh, keep on refining our manipulation techniques, which are pretty, pretty uh, accurate by now. But um, if we keep going this way, I mean, the way I see it, we are trapped in, um, in a spell or in multiple spells. We live in, in multiple realities. And uh, if, we, if we keep on pushing this, I think we'll lose contact with all reality. And I don't mean reality in a metaphysical sense. I mean, reality in a, in a social sense, something we build together uh, through social interaction, you mm -hmm. see? So what I, what I do see ahead is probably collapse from it. Collapse in, in, collapse in terms of like a social sanity, social coherence. Mm, yeah, I think societal collapse and, uh, and psychological collapse. Well, the societal collapse, I think, uh, kind of has psychological collapse within it so yeah both inner so, and outer yeah do you, do you mean in the sense that it actually is like almost you know because obviously in societal collapse a lot of people be thinking of like riots and buildings on fire but actually it's almost the mm -hmm. inverse of that in that it collapses in the fact that there's no longer any um society is one just absolutely homogenous manufactured lump that would actually be the collapse of society Mm, yes. Well, I think that would be the stage before the true collapse, which <laughs> would be an eco econo cataclysm. And um, but yeah, I think uh, before that, we, you could have that have like homogenized uh, world. I think that's already happened. We are living through it. But now it's breaking apart and you see a lot of what I call in the book, uh, demiurgic bubbles. Mm -hmm. So many people live in, in different realities. They believe different things. There is no way to, to relate between them, you see? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then I think we, we are confronted with a very real possibility of collapse within this century if we didn't change direction, which I find very hard to do. So, God. A, man so after my, a man after my own heart. <laughs> I mean, I'm in, I'm in complete agreement with you. I mean, it, probably most okay. of the people, most of the people that listen to the, the podcast are probably smiling because I mean, this is, uh, you know, I mean, there's not going to be too, too much debate here because I'm on. I wouldn't even consider it pessimism anymore. I just call it like, you know, looking looking outside and realizing that mm -hmm. everything's slowly going down. But there you go. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I try try and uh, yeah, put out things to here. help people, but um. Yeah, so I mean, this this would actually bring bring us this idea of collapse would actually bring us to. I'm writing something about collapse at the moment, and I yes. consider one of the cornerstones of of the modern world, which has led us to collapse, to be something that you bring up as well. And this is why I loved your book so much. You know, yes. almost immediately is because, and this this is where I thought he must be inspired by Greer because this is what he writes about so much is that 
but you just seem to have come to the same conclusions separately, which is great. Uh, which is that the 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 overarching spell of the modern world is progress, the notion of progress, and you know this almost bastardization of teleology in itself that that every single facet of life has to and is always inherently progressing but simply for the fact that we just sort of as you said earlier with the Komsky and thing you know manufactured we're just manufactured mm-hmm. to believe right it's all good we live in the modern world so we must mm-hmm. be progressing right so <laughs> where <laughs> where do you where do you see this idea of progress sort of being built from and, and why do you think it's so important okay um well, the way I see it is, and I'm drawing a lot from uh, John Gray here, and it's that, um, well, I think this notion of progress is is both magical and uh, religious. And uh, well, I say that because, um, okay, how, how to put this? I see, you know, I, I think progress is rooted in, in the Christian idea of salvation and it's a kind of salvation that can be achieved in history. That's progress. Now, uh, this Christian idea of salvation, the notion that we are moving towards a better place, uh, was replaced in modern times by the notion that progress was possible through continued scientific and, and technical, uh, techno- technological efforts. But this at heart, I think, is a religious notion turned into, into a secular dogma. So what I think happened is that after a certain point, um, probably in the 17th or 18th century, uh, the teleological aspect of, you know, an inherent, an inherent purpose or an end goal or a final cause of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, the idea of salvation, it became deterministic. And after that, you get the idea of progress is actually leading somewhere as, for example, in, in neoliberalism, which since the 19th century has taken for granted that we are going uh, towards a global society uh, with only one economic system, or you get the telos of philosophies of uh, Hegel and Marx, for example. But yeah, I think that is essentially religious. It's uh, uh, the way I see it is undeniable. And plus, I think it's religious in the sense that um, you would, I mean, it takes a lot of faith to believe in progress these days. I mean, you have to, you have to be like almost religious in, into, into that to, to believe that this could work, that we are actually going to a better place. Do you think most people are just unconscious in that belief, though, that they believe, actually believe it so much that, that it doesn't actually matter what happens externally because mm-hmm. progress is there, right? So it just doesn't matter, like... It doesn't matter if, you know, I saw the other day and I tweeted about it that uh, in New York, like trash bags are piled above head height. And that's that's fine. That's normal because we're Mm -hmm. progressing. So like nothing matters. (laughs) They just believe it. So, yeah. Yeah. So they're so unconscious about that belief that you don't really need you don't need proof to believe it anymore because it just is the belief. Mm, Yeah, I think that is the case for most people. We could say that. And, uh, well, I think it is the case because we we are still religious beings in many senses, and, and also we believe in magic in many senses, although we won't admit this to ourselves. But, um, but I mean, this kind of thing passes, uh, you know, without being absurd precisely because of that, because we are not willing to accept how, how magic or thinking is or how religion is how religious or, or thinking really is. So we are living in a world that is mostly made up of layers of repressed religion and magic, you know, all on top of the other. So what I wanted to do, for example, what I wanted to do in this book was to, to uh, reveal one of these layers, to say, okay, we have this magical layer uh, that is covered uh, by a lot of, uh, you know, contemporary philosophy and contemporary uh, technological advancement, but it is there and it's still influencing us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So why is it so, why do you think it's so important that the magical and mystical and religious connotations are taken away? And, and even, even if we're entering into this new 
paradigm of religion where science is religion and technology is religion it seems that the 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 eros the vital force anything along those lines which is even remotely spiritual that that you know we have to take that away in almost like a fear that we wouldn't be taken seriously do you think there's a reason that that needs needed to be stripped away hmm. well i don't think there was like an uh, evident reason i think it's something that just happened as we progressed <laughs> as a civilization i mean you know the moment uh, that uh, you know the, the scientific revolution took place in the 17th century we began to stress more and more on the quantifiable aspects of nature and at that moment when we began to quantify as opposed to qualify we began to to strip reality uh, to, i mean to strip uh, all these layers of religion and magic but, but we didn't do away with them we just uh, you know we just uh, buried them underneath but they are you know too uh, far too ingrained into the western psyche to be simply put away that's what i think mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i mean perhaps we've sort of touched on this but where do you where do you see them coming out um in in modern life you know what where are the places we can see them you know the, these religious or magical traditions are almost trying to push through and they they sort of bow their heads in a way and we have to you know, instead of saying, oh, that's a ritual, we might say, oh, that's a habit. Instead of saying, you know, that's mm-hmm. a, uh, that's the sacred, we might just say that that's, uh, I don't know, high tech or something along these lines. But, mm-hmm. you know, is there some clear areas where we can say, no, 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 that we're just entering mm-hmm. into that same religious pattern again? Well, out of the top of my head, I, I can't say anything. Well, I, I can tell you that I have magical thoughts all the time. You know, I'm not a ritualistic person. But personally, um, you know, I'm thinking in magical terms uh, from the moment I wake up. And by this, I mean, uh, I tend to think, for example, if I'm, you know, I'm driving and if I see a red light, I think, OK, I uh, just I want it to, to change. I think I may change it. I know it's not possible, but I do have this kind of uh, thinking in my in my head. It happens to me all the time. I don't know how it is for other people, but uh, yeah, well, that's my experience, I think. Wow. I never knew anyone else did that. So uh, I'm so no. happy that what? someone else does that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you do it too. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but that's, yeah. that's the point. I mean, this is something we were talking about. You know, one thing I should say is you, you've translated the the Illumina, Illuminatus trilogy by Robert Anton Wilson. Mm-hmm. And this is something we were talking about before. Um, about Robin Anton Wilson and, you know, my initial interest was from Prometheus Rising. And mm-hmm. that sort of stuck, one of the, the exercises in that book has always stuck with, with me, that willing of, uh, I believe it's the willing of certain coins on the ground and whether or not you, you're you deciding whether or not they just, they're just there randomly or because mm-hmm. you started the day and you sort of said, right, I'm going to see the, I'm going to find more coins on the ground. You know, mm-hmm. it's, and it's the same exercise is like, did I have a good time uh, you know with my friends because it was just a good time or did I have a good time because at the start of the day I said right I'm gonna have a good time today and willed it and yeah I'm mm. also I'm also sort of always doing these little things so yeah. I mean I guess the way you know these have been washed over by you know positive thinking or like CBT therapy or things like that like the power of positive thinking which seems to have been stripped of that initial mystical thought mm-hmm. of like willing it's just uh it's just seen as like a a scientific ex- explanation. Yeah, yeah. They, they they tend to make it look more scientific. Now, now that you mentioned that, um, it's you know there there is this um like intermediate phase. Uh, I speak about this in the book, uh, in which you know uh, the predecessors, the direct predecessors of New Age appear in the scene that is late nineteenth century. And what they have is this incredible magical thinking that if you that if you set your mind to something, that if you're positive about things, you'll get whatever you want because you deserve it, right? It is your birthright to get all the things you want. And you know, that is that is intensely magical and intensely religious. What they did was they they 
packaged it in this, uh, they give it this new package that was thoroughly capitalist. So they sell you the book, like The Secret, but this was already happened in the 19th century. <laughs> but, but it's, you know, it's completely magical, I think. And it's, I mean, it's so popular because it's undeniable that we think that way and that to an extent it does work. So yeah, and well, I'm not a big fan of New Age, which I consider crap for the most part. But um, but what I mean is, it is there. It's on the Apple, and people need it. So what the market is doing is they're just catering for that need. Mm-hmm. What what sort of major alteration though do you see then that the market does between that and you know the earlier or the Renaissance more sincere authentic stuff? What do you think's been taken away? Hmm. No, I think it might be a matter of depth and, uh, well, I wouldn't, uh, you mean in the way, you know, the market strips magic away from, you know, its basic, uh, substance. Mm -hmm. Well, I think people are not aware anymore that they are, you know, doing kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're being magical about things and, Back in the Renaissance, you know, magicians were actually, uh, they were aware of what they were doing. They had pretty, uh, you know, have pretty strong willpower to put into their spells or their sigils or that kind of thing. So I think what what the market has done is to bury this this layer of, of magical thought deeper into the psyche. That's, I think in order to to sell it as a as a product in order to to you know to hug it as, as a commodity it's almost like in in acting out our desires for capitalism by undertaking various routines of wanting to get something we're sort of unwillingly or un you know unknowingly performing mm-hmm. some form of chaos magic in a way you know we're performing a mental sort of sigil or a mental performance to try mm-hmm. and get something or is that a bit of a stretch yeah. Well, it, it could be happening. It's not the way I would put it. Sure. I think, you know, I think the magic is coming from the other end. I think it's more uh, that the commodities have, you know, they, they have this mystical aura about them, what Marx called the, the commodity fetishism. So they are, you, commodities are the ones that are uh, tempting us and taunting us constantly. So we are drawn to them, so we buy them, so we consume them. That, that I think, is the idea. So we do our part of magical thinking, yes. But I think the market itself became this huge, uh, how, how to put it, like a magical, like a spell spewing machine that's constantly producing more and more spells so people consume more. That's the, the way I would see it. Yeah. Is, that, is that a way to sort of, increasingly get us more lost so we'll never be able to sort of get back to a base level where we you know a, a level where we could realize hey maybe i don't actually need all this all this gizmo rubbish yes well i don't think it's done consciously like that i think you know on a rational level what they want is to is to sell their product it's simply it's a pecuniary uh uh objective but then and I think you, you, you asked me this before, as I think, you know, this is, this is an instrument of, of control, you know, uh, how can I explain it? It's more that, um, you know, I, I think the purpose is, is of all this mechanism is to have an, a, a content population, right? Mm-hmm. I, I think, uh, how to put this? I think, you know, for example, when they sell you lifestyles, this is pretty. This is pretty strange. So they give you the appearance of descent. You know, you you are. Uh, let's say you are back in the nineties. You were grunge, right? But this is something they have absorbed, right? Mm-hmm. So what they're giving you is, you know, a, a certain inoffensive amount of control to keep you in line. You know, to keep you from real descent. So you never come up with a with a real alternative to the system. I think this does happen. It may sound paranoid now that, <laughs> that I say it out loud, but I think it's sort of um, 
it's ingrained in the system mm. you know, to, to kind of uh, entangle you in that way. I think we see that a lot these days with uh, conserv- yeah. conservatives saying that they're the new, the new punk rock, but really they don't falling for they're falling for the same falling for the oh. same trap. But at the same time, okay. punk rock yeah. is also falling for the same trap of society needs punk rock because that's a very comfortable thing that they you know that they, the government or the state have no worries about that that it's it's you know easily commodifiable so mm-hmm, totally so, but i mean you, you know beneath all these realities that people are entering into these these bubbles these um these you know demiurge bubbles as you say do you think do you believe mm-hmm. in such a thing as sort of a sort of an authentic baseline and you know an original so you know in quotation marks original reality which in itself is is true mm, yeah sure i think um we, you know, if, if we define reality as a consensual construction created through social interaction, yes, there as there there is a reality out there. The baseline is out there. We just need to to interact. The problem is that this would mean to uh, greatly reduce the ability of media and, and social networks, you know, the whole of the media establishment, to influence us uh, for commercial profit or political gain. And um, or at least put a limit to the ways in which they manufacture consent um, and not just consent anymore, but confusion or outright violence, as we have seen recently in the U.S., for example. But uh, I think that's just the beginning, because it's not only the media that's absorbing us, but uh, capitalism as a whole. And, you know, that may seem to be another question, but. It's just another trap we have gotten ourselves into and now we can't seem to get out of. So it's, you know, it's kind of a compounded problem. We have, we have the media trap and then we have the economic trap, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in what way would one com- sort of, in what way would some someone be and someone attend and direct themselves within reality to be able to sort of before they're drawn into these traps, sort of stop and question, you know, do you think there is a means, a modern means or a, a way that one can sort of understand if they're entering into these, uh, I don't want to say non-consensual, but it, an advertising is non-consensual because you're not entirely, you don't have the full understanding of what an advert is doing to you, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you mean the ways, I mean, like a way in which you can uh, avoid falling into that trap? for you mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay well i think uh probably you you would have to um kind of restrict yourself or think about what you're doing every time you come into into contact with the uh, with some kind of information you could try to ask yourself uh what is where is this coming from who is behind it you know what are they selling or what's the, the narrative behind it? The, that's pretty, that's exhausting if you think about it. I mean, I try to watch news. I, I, I use different uh, outlets to do that. And in the end, I don't know what they're selling me. I don't know what reality, I mean, I do get the sense to do that. So I know that I'm trapped in this way of seeing things or the other. But at this point, I think the main thing is to know that at least uh, to at least know that we are trapped. And uh, I think I'm kind of a, a Gnostic in that sense, uh, not in the original sense of the word, of the word, but you could say that I'm a social Gnostic uh, in that I believe that society and, of course, capitalism and media are leading us uh, in the wrong way. And we need to build a new sort of knowledge, uh, a Gnosis, so to speak, to get out of our predicament so so to get out of this black iron prison as as uh, philip k dick would say it uh we would need to you know at the very least create a, a new epistemology that's i think what's actually needed we need to start interacting with reality in a certain way that would shield us from from all this spell do you think it's always uh, it's always been that way even you know stretching back to like mesopotamia and egypt or do you think that this this labyrinthian mess of realities that you get caught up in is truly 
you know, from the industrial sort of industrial revolution onwards? Or do you think that there's always been a possibility for that, for people to just be lost? I mean, I guess when you go back in, in time, most cultures mm. and societies would probably adhere to, you know, most would adhere to a single religion there. Mm, well, yes, I, I think it's um, it's a modern um, phenomenon. Even more, it's a postmodern phenomenon, I think. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, thousands of years ago, people only had one way of looking at things because it was the way. So one religion, one way, for example, in early Christian times, there was one God, one religion. That was it, if you were you know, a Westerner. But right now, there are so many options. And this came with, with the market. There are so many options. There are so many uh, political systems or things that could happen politically or economically. So many lifestyles, so many commodities. So you get trapped. It's, it's all, I mean, having that variety is almost impossible not to, to fall in one trap or the other. So I do think it's a, it's a modern and, and postmodern um, phenomenon, yes. So do you... Do you... Would you say that anyone? Would you say that anyone in within postmodern times within this labyrinth can said to be alive in any real sense? If you're if you're born into a reality you don't even know mm. is not the real reality. It's sort of like a Matrix question, I guess. Is that you never truly know where you are or almost when you are. Mm. So you know, are you, are you are you truly alive in that sense? Mm, yeah, I think so. Well, um. I'm taking reality as a social construction mm -hmm. and uh, well, well, in that sense, we can consider ourselves to be barely awake. Sure. But um, I think we are alive. I mean, we are barely awake if we continue to be immersed in, in the media, but uh, waking up is still an option, at least individually. Uh, you know, when we, when we take uh, things on a, on a social level, it becomes, it becomes more complicated. So, but, you know, I personally think that a, a big part of the problem nowadays is, is digital media, which, um, you know, can hardly be taken as media anymore. And by these, I mean that traditional media assumed a flow of information uh, from sender through a medium to a receiver. And uh, this was completely disrupted by social networks in which everyone becomes a sender and a receiver at the same time. So this situation uh, kind of destroys the directionality uh, necessary for a medium to be such. And um, additionally, it fosters what I call the democratization of pneumatic manipulation, in which any person has access to, to a set of tools to manipulate his or her audience via social networks. So what I think is that this situation is kind of a, deficient regression to a mythical stage of consciousness in the sense that we become trapped in an artificial and, and degraded form of anima mundi of the soul of the world in which for example you can take celebrities as uh, archetypes that kind of thing i think is what's going on now so it's almost like a, a feedback loops within a fractal so we sort of uh, have a yeah. a mimesis of everything that's above us so you know there's a larger celebrity that is controlling some people in some way and then smaller mm -hmm. and smaller and smaller to the point where everyone everyone so the underlying theory thing i guess is that everyone is gravitating towards that sense that the purpose of existence is a form of controlling either controlling your environment or controlling those around you yeah totally i mean at this point i think we can say there are tendency to control which or manipulate, which is a natural impulse in humans, meaning everyone manipulates, uh, is completely out of control. I mean, it's it's gone out of control, and now we can, you know, get it back in the box. So the question is, how how do you, how do we control ourselves? Well, for my part, what I did is I I abandoned social media uh, some years ago. I decided that I I didn't want to take part. Uh, of this because it was you know it, it, it wasn't benefiting society it wasn't benefiting me and I took the step but I don't know if most people are willing to take that step if they are connected with uh, you know friends family uh, workmates that kind of thing so, so it's pretty difficult for most people but uh, I, that would be one way to to control things to to subtract yourself 
from the equation to to kind of step back and say, okay, this doesn't benefit me. I'll just I'll get away from it. That's one way to work. I think. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's because of of sort of status and just common modern reasons that people don't want to do that, like feeling left out and peer pressure? Or do you think there might be a de deeper, sort of almost magical reason as to why people don't? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think there is a magic, you know, a magical reason. I think people need the approval. Uh, I think social networks are such a success because uh, people want to be heard. People want other people to pay attention to them. That is like a, uh, a basic human need. So what these companies are doing is they are uh, taking advantage of that situation. And doing so, they have made millions of dollars it's, it's amazing the the amount of money you can make out of those uh, well we didn't call it human flaws but you know those those human things that that make us sociable that make us want to be approved and yeah it's you know it's a sorry state of affairs i think mm -hmm. um so i mean the, the the big thing here then i mean i guess for me i mean you've said this a couple of times i mean, I mean this is the where a lot of the lot of these sort of books will go one way and a lot will go the other way and a lot of documentaries on this sort of topic of control will always almost mm. have the some sort of malicious conspiratorial edge underneath them as if there is some agency somewhere that's you know <laughs> they've all got together in a big cabal in a skyscraper and have, have agreed somehow to just <laughs> control everyone and you know at least you you make you're making it clear that that isn't the case that it is simply for the for for the boring reasons of they want to sell something or they want to peddle some goods and they want mm -hmm. some money or they want some attention or they want some status. And mm -hmm. so in that sense, it's control for control's sake. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, where this is all, this is an extremely vague qu question, but I mean, I guess in, in, in theorization, where could you actually go from that when there is no substance beneath anyone's actions? You know, they are for it's control for its own sake. Right. There is no thing that we could sort of go in, remove or play around with. There is sort of nothing there. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I never thought about it that way, but that's, <laughs> a, that's a horrifying perspective. Well, I, I, I don't know if it's... Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. I don't know if it's uh, really... Um, if this is really what is going on, I would like to think there is no master plan, sure. Uh, although I think there are some conspiracies out there, sure, as Robert Anton Wilson, for example, would have it. There are plenty. But um, the problem now, I think, is that there are so many conspiracies, so many agendas, so many goals to be made. And now, now that everyone is participating into this, what you get is noise. What you get is utter confusion. So, you know, that perspective you just outlined is... I find it terrifying because if I thought there wasn't a master plan, what you are, what you're doing is actually taking away any, any sense out of it, which by the way, may be what's going on. I mean, I just, I think I, I wrote a book and I built this context in, into which I was trying to make sense of the whole situation, but maybe the whole situation, this is a way of describing the situation but the whole situation is that, that we may be going into a, a void society, a society devoid of, of sense and goals, just manipulation for itself. It, it may be mm -hmm. a real thing. Yeah. But then, you know, like you said earlier, sort of if you say, oh, if you, if you think to yourself, oh, there's, there's all this noise, you then end up in that same sort of almost schizophrenic, paranoid feedback mm -hmm. where you think, are they, are they developing the noise to keep me, you know, from questioning the noise etc and you can keep going into it and into it and the deeper you get i think it probably would seem like you, the more and more sense you're you're making of it sort of like alex uh, alex jones just going out going into it over and over again yeah well now that you mentioned it yes that that not that does make sense and i think it's well i don't know how how uh aware they are of doing this they may and in some instances they are but uh, I think about when, when you mentioned this, I think about um, um, QAnon. I mean, they are actually doing that. People get addicted. They go down the rabbit hole and they stay there for years, completely convinced this whole conspiracy is it. That 
that that really is the reality of things. So yes, you, you can get that kind of uh, situation uh, empowered by network effects that may very well be the situation, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. We've touched on, uh, you know, a lot of the sort of big overarching themes of your book. Is there anything sort of key that, that you think we've glossed over or missed? And I mean, there is, for anyone who would like to get the book, there is a lot, there's obviously a lot mm -hmm. more going in and you, you go into far more... Uh, the specific, especially mm -hmm. of uh, Bruno's work, which is extremely interesting. Is there anything you you feel we've we've missed? Um, no, not really. Um, well, I think, well, maybe people should know more about how Renaissance magic worked. I don't know; mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. it would be interesting. Mm -hmm. in, in, okay. In that. But yeah, I mean, it, when I found out about it, when I began studying about that. Um, I realized that there was this whole tradition that was working now. And I found it very, you know, I found that connection uh, relieving in a sense. I always felt that I was like drifting in this uh, modern times. And I felt like an anchor. So I don't know if that could help people to see that, that our time is actually anchored to a previous time. And that we are not adrift. We are. We can make sense of it. Okay. Yeah. 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 If if you could expand expand on that, those those connections. Yeah. Well, I think well one of the most interesting things I found was that of the anima mundi, and is that um, well that is a concept you as you know and, and probably many of the listeners is kind of the soul of the world, and it kind of appears time and again in, in different transformations and different disguises. Um, through the centuries, you can you can find it in, um, say, uh, in the eighteenth century as the ether in, in physics, or as the biotope, which is the direct uh, predecessor of the ecosystem in the nineteenth century um, biology. But you can actually find the anima mundi in, in networks today. I believe it was Ted Nelson, one of the one of the pioneers of digital networks, who believed, had this quasi-magical belief that these networks should work, uh, you know, in a holistic way. They should represent um, knowledge holistically, which to me is really reminiscent of the Anima Mundi. So we are still living in this, in this magical world, you know, subconsciously. And I think people should, you know, uh, be aware of that that's that's fairly comforting, and I think that's probably something for people mm -hmm. who who do feel a bit lost to almost strive towards developing a a, mm -hmm. a a deeper connection with that old world. That if we're still there, then you know, as you say, yeah. it's as you say, it's never something that you can get rid of. And we're always within that same pattern of religious thinking, and mm -hmm. you know, idols or the sacred or rituals, yeah. they all just come around again in a sort of a cyclic fashion. So mm. totally yes. Um. Okay, okay. Um, whereabouts can we find your, your book? Uh, it's on Amazon. You can find it there. And uh, yeah, that's probably the main outlet right now. Okay, that sounds... Um, where, do, you said you got rid of your social media, but is there anywhere online that we could read your, read your work? Do you do essays or pieces? Or? Uh, yeah, I have an academia, an academia profile. You can go there. I have some... Uh, most of my essays are in Spanish. But I've translated some of them, so you can you can go to my academia profile. You can search Maurizio Loza there and not and go to my profile, I guess. Cool. Okay. Um, Maurizio Loza, thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, James.